And happy Sabbath. What an honor it is to be before you today in God's house. Today we have a divine appointment, I like to say. Amen. I want to introduce you to a God that I know, a God that helps out sinners like myself. Amen. Now, Pastor Harold has been talking about the Sabbath quite a bit. It's an important subject, right? And the way that Jesus taught was to use illustrations. Now, some of you were here last week, and if I brought up a grave site or graveyard, does that trigger the entire sermon that we learned last week about how we don't trample upon the Sabbath? We walk how? Carefully, correctly, nicely. Respectfully, I like that. Does anybody know what this looks like? It's not, but it looks like an egg, hopefully. I tried my best. This is today's illustration, all right? amen? Before we begin, let's invite God's present here, and then we're going to talk about, talk about our world and what's wrong with it, amen? The Lord our Father... At a time more than ever, we need you now. At a time when humanity thinks they have it because of our technology. At a time when we think we might be self-sufficient and we got our own riches, Lord, we ask that we need you now more than ever. As this world seems like it's falling apart, Lord, we know you have it all together. As our own personal lives start crumbling before us, Lord, we know you have a plan of restoration. Lord, I need you to help me now because I'm not a man fit to preach a sermon. So, Lord, I need you to speak the words that need to be spoken. I need you to allow me to be a piece of glass that your light might shine through me, and I won't inhibit any of your message. So open the eyes, open the ears, and open the minds and hearts of all those before me and those who are watching. Allow them to see you, Lord, and not me. And may I even draw closer, as my brothers and sisters watch you, may they draw closer to you through this message. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, may his children say, Amen. Amen. An egg is a marvelous thing. But I'm going to talk about a penguin egg today. Do you know what it takes to get a penguin out of this shell? It takes a lot. Now, most penguins are in Antarctica. How cold is it right now? Anybody know? I, I set my weather app for Antarctica. Technology's awesome. Today's uh, temperature is negative 59 degrees. It's uh, only a subtle 25 mile, mile per hour wind, and the low will be a blistering negative 62 degrees. Kind of cold, right? Compared to Texas, especially. Do you know when this egg is made and it, it is delivered onto the earth, the father penguin takes this egg and balances it on his feet. And he has to do that. Because if he does not, if this thing rolls onto the icy tundra, it's going to freeze and be destroyed almost immediately. So the father tirelessly, patiently, has this balance on his feet, watching it constantly. Now I got a question for you. Can a father hunt while he has an egg on his feet? No, he cannot. Can, 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 a, can he go move around and go swimming? No, he has to stay put. The penguin actually might lose up to 50% of its body mass before this thing turns into a penguin. That's what I call a very persistent father, a caring and loving father, amen? I want to put this down. It would look ridiculous if I carried that the whole time. But I'm going to try to balance the egg. See, even by itself, it's hard to balance, but God is so good. Yeah, we serve a very persistent and loving God. At least that's the God I serve. I know through every day of this world's history, he has his finger in our lives. He's balancing us until he can get us home. Amen? 
And, and this world is very toxic. It's kind of like the Antarctica. Though it's not negative 59 degrees, sin has one job on this earth. It's to kill you. That's it. It's not, it's not, it's not for a, a subtle distraction. It's not for some kind of pleasure. Its purpose is to kill you. That's the devil's purpose with your life. God's purpose is that you might have life everlasting, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that all who might believe in him might have everlasting life. But we got to believe. We got to believe in our promise. He warns us today, just like Jesus was warning the disciples thousands of years ago. If you turn to your Bibles, Matthew chapter 24, we're going to start there. Jesus was irritated. He cleaned out the temple because the religious leaders, like pastors much like myself, weren't doing his will. In fact, they were selling and trading on the Sabbath inside the temple of God, and they were trading the sacrificial services that were supposed to expunge sin. So they made sin cost money, and that really angered Jesus. And so he left that house, and as he's walking away, he says, this left you desolate. He keeps going on. The disciples try to cheer him up. And then he tells his disciples, do you not see all these things in verse 2? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon here another that shall not be thrown down. That shut the disciples up pretty quick. They didn't know what to say. Jesus gets angry very seldom in the Bible, but when he does get angry, guess what? It's for a purpose. He was upset for a good reason. People are trying to steal salvation from his children. They're trying to steal life away from those he came for. And so that angers Jesus, right? And so they kind of wait till he calms down a little bit. They get to a clearing. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, where he always went to pray at, his disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and what? The end of the age. That means the last days. That means right before Jesus comes. Amen? Okay. First thing he says, take heed that what? No one deceives you. Make sure no one tricks you because they're going to try. For many will come in my name saying I am the Christ. Many will deceive many and will hear of wars and rumors of wars. So you see that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. By the way, last night when we were doing our youth meeting with the flock, the message was this exact message. So I know that the Holy Spirit's working. Sharon gave a, a knockout message on a very similar subject I'm talking about today. So apparently for our youth, you've got to hear it twice. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 1. But know this, starting off in verse 1, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Are those fun times? No, perilous is not fun. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, in our world today, do we see some of this coming to pass? Unfortunately, yes. We, we are distracted. We love our pleasure more than we love our God sometimes. We love to talk when we don't know all the facts sometimes. It gets bad. You can kill somebody's character by just being a false witness, can't you? What's being lost? What's being lost is our conscience. What's being lost is our conscience. Now, why is that a bad thing? Why would I even bring that up? Do you know who provides your conscience? The Holy Spirit. And if, our lo if we're losing our 
our conscience. Now do you see the issue, why I bring it up? The Holy Spirit came for a few reasons. To convict of sin, to convict of righteousness, and then to have us knowing that there's going to be a judgment. Have that impending feeling like a dog knows a storm is coming. We know a judgment's on its way. And we can feel it tangibly in our bones. But if we don't know about righteousness and we don't know about sin, because our consciousness is is starting to quiet that still small voice within our hearts, we are in perilous danger. In the past week alone, I did a little research, just gentle research. In the past week alone, Ebola outbreaks are taking over Rwanda and Congo. Wildfires, wildfires consume the entire Greek islands, defeating 200 firefighters, 75 trucks, helicopters, planes, water bombs, you name it, they couldn't control it. Same thing in France with 900 firefighters. There was a flood that forced 25,000 people to evacuate Ethiopia, 250,000 people to evacuate China, 3 million people without power, and there's about 40 or 50 other incidences that are, depri- that are depriving people of homes and life in this past week. In the past three weeks, we've had multiple shootings. And that's the saddest part. We had one real close to home in El Paso, Texas. There has been 25 shootings, 55 dead, and 145 injured. That's in three weeks. That's in three weeks. That took years before. I don't care if you're religious or not. I've asked strangers, and they know that something has to give. There's two main polarizations with people who are not religious. Either humanity is going to wipe out humanity, or the world is just going to break apart. So either either my nature is going to win, or humanity is going to defeat itself. Now, I serve a God, which I have faith in, amen? And I know he is going to come before either of those two scenarios take place. It says so in the Bible. What was our scripture verse for today in Matthew 24, verse 30? I'll tell you what, let's go to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, which days? Those days, talking about the last days, right? The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken. The sign, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, when I preached previously, I was talking about those who dwell on the earth and those who dwell on God. These are those who dwell on the earth. Those are those who don't believe in God right now. They will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven and power and great glory. Because I have a question. If you saw Jesus Christ coming through the clouds with great glory, great power, would you be mourning or would you be joyful? I'd be joyful. I'd be happy. This is finally all over. I'm hopefully going to be drawn up to him, but even if not, it's all over. But I'll still be, I'll still be really excited to see him. And verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end, of heaven, one end of heaven to the other. And now we're going to try to tie this in to a few places today. And uh, I don't got to beat around the bush. I was going to talk about the, the beginning of, of birth pangs. That's related to a woman giving birth, right? And I'm not sure if you... Uh, think that we are in the beginning of birth pangs, but we're nowhere near the beginning. We're at the very latter half. Now, are our birth pains, mothers, are birth pains pleasant to have? Do you enjoy having contractions? Or? No, it's not, a, it's not a pleasurable thing, right? But is the baby you have afterward, is that a pleasurable thing? Is it a miracle? A, 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 a child about the size of that egg inside your stomach that's been incubating for nine months without no air, really, but yet surviving within you, and then it's birth, and now it breathes air 
it cries and looks just like mom or dad or both mom and dad. So even though these end times, it seems as if the earth is just shaking to pieces. The end result is like a baby. You won't remember. The mother doesn't remember, oh, yes, while she's holding her baby. Oh, those contractions were so horrible. No, she's looking at the eyes of her child. And everything else is like, I don't don't care what happened. It's over. It's done. There's no more. That's the way this world will fade away. The birth pains might be sour. They might steal people from us. It might rob us of either health or wealth or families. But this bitter sorrowness will go away. And it will be replaced with amazing life that we cannot possibly comprehend. You cannot put your finger on it. I guarantee it. Try your best. God will outdo you. Amen? But we found out that he's gathering his elect from the four winds. I want to be part of that elect. Do you? He's gathering his elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. I want to learn what that elect is. So if we could turn in our Bibles to Exodus, this is where the majority of our study has been for the past month, and I want to return there because it's, it's that important. Exodus chapter 31, and we'll start off in verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, Surely, My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a what? It is a sign between me and you, how long? Throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord. Now, the word who sanctifies you is not giving enough credit. That's a participle. And it means I am not just sanctifying you for a moment. I'm going to continue to sanctify you until it's over. He is continually, it's like adding an I-N-G, I am sanctifying you. I am continually making you holy. All right? Let's, go, let's jump down to verse 17. Again, he says, it is a sign between who? Me and the children of Israel for how long? Forever. Forever. Now this, I don't want you to miss this next part. This is awesome. I I read this and made me smile. I love when I read the Bible and smile. Ready? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was... All right. Now, I'm not sure. Do you like to be blessed and refreshed at the same time? I'm kind of liking to be blessed and refreshed. Now, I do feel pretty refreshed on the Sabbath. I get to chill out a little bit. I get to take a little break, and I get to breathe. Because the week's pretty heavy. But being blessed and refreshed, man, that just, for me, sells the Sabbath. I'm good. That's all I got to tell me. But it's a, we find out it's a sign. This word sign means a token, if I was going to put it in English terms. Has anybody ever gone to an arcade? Swallow? You guys ever gone to arcade? Ever gone to, uh, like, uh, what's that place called? Main event? Or one of those uh, places like a movie theater? Have you gone to uh, a golf course or a putt-putt? You always buy tokens, right? And you turn that token in and you get to go win. Or if you got a ticket for a movie theater, you give the ticket, the guy tears it in half, gives you your stub, and then you get to go into the movie. But without the ticket, you can't go in. Does that make sense? So this Sabbath, he says, is like a token. It's an actual tangible item that you need to have. All right? And he says, Surely my Sabbath shall, you shall keep, for it is a token, it is a sign between me and you. And you must, because you need to know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Nobody else can. So this token is to establish a connection between where he wants you and where you are. So he has a plan to take you to heaven, right? You're not going to get in without his token. 
You have to have his tokens. Now, he has more than one token. We have the Ten Commandments. If we go to Exodus chapter 31, and was it 31? Am I right or wrong about that? Let me see. I fly all over the place. I don't go by my notes. Okay, Exodus chapter... Uh, oh, mercy. Let me switch my Bible. Oh, well, I guess it's not going to be read right now. I'll get it in a second. But um, when we take it as a sign, and when he's talking to Moses, he's tell, he tells Moses, I believe it's Exodus chapter 30, but I'm not going to go to it right now. He says, I need you, because you guys will know this, I need you to bind these around your heart like a necklace. I need you to put them onto the palm of your hand or the back of your hand on, on the frontlets of your forehead. What am I talking about? His commandments. And this is right after he gave the commandments. And so he's saying, I, these are so important, I need you to bind them to you. Now why would he say on your hand and on your head? What's the purpose of that? Because the Israelites took it quite literally, and they started binding boxes on their hands, and they started putting boxes on their head with a little scripture inside of them. But why would they do that? Now, what's in between what you think and what you do? What's the, inner, what, what's, what's the part in between that's controlling all of that? Your heart, your intentions. If you take thought and you put to action... It's your intention. Now, it's funny that the enemy is trying to do the same thing. He wants to give you a mark, too. He wants to put a mark on your head and on your hand. We're not going to go into that today, but there's a fight over you for your thoughts and for your actions. Does that make sense? And this, the result of this is what are you going to be holding what kind of token do you have? What kind of ticket do you possess? If we go to Revelation chapter 7, we're going to start up in the first verse. And it says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not do what? Blow on the earth or the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to do, the harm, to do harm to the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Here we see two things. We see the seal of God, we see the forehead and the four winds, right? And I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000, and all tribes of Israel were sealed. Now, if that number has been pestering you for a while, I want you to go to verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, right? Which, which was 144,000, which no one could number. Okay, the first one is a symbolic number. The second one is the actual number. Okay, there's not just 144,000 people and then that's it. No more seal ink. I'm sorry, we got to go. No, he's going to seal every single last person he can. Amen? In our meditation today, if you pull your bulletin out, small print, I want to read through this real fast. This is E.G. White's interpretation, and I love it so much. It stuck with me, and when I made this sermon, I had to include it. And it says, Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the, four, to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth. What was their work? The winds. And the winds were going to harm the earth, right? And the sea and all the things and the trees and everything aside there, right? 
And he was waving something up and down, it says. What was he waving up and down? And what was in his hand? It's on verse 2 in chapter 7 of Revelation. It was the, the seal of God. Right? And this angel was crying out what? Hold! Stop! Don't! Hold on a second longer. And I'm sure they were letting go because they're like, oh, well, it's time. It's, uh, it's time that God said it was going to be the end. Let's just go ahead and just let the winds go and let the earth be damaged. Let everything that's supposed to happen, happen. We're done with our job. And as they're letting go, the angel says, no. And they, they grab hold again. And they're, and they're pulling back the wind. You can see their white knuckles as they're trying to control all that trouble, right? And I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and, the, and what the four angels were about to do. And he says to me, that was God that restrained the powers. And that he gave his angels charge over the things on the earth that the four angels had power from God to hold them, hold the four winds. And that they were about to let them go. But, now here's the awesome part. While their hands were what? Loosening, the four winds were about to blow. The merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that, that were not what? That were not sealed. And he raised his hand to the Father and pleaded with him and said, I spilled my blood for these. For each person here, my blood was spilled. For their families, for their neighbors, for their enemies, for every single person, I spilled my blood. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the fore and bid them to hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their, in their foreheads. I found it, I found it. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, I was getting ahead of myself. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. What chapter? Verse 18. It says, fix these words, and he's referring to the commandments of God, of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Now, if I had to ask you what the most controversial commandment was, would it be, thou shalt not murder? No. Steal? We still go to jail for those things, right? Lying, mom and dad told us that was bad, but yet sometimes they fib. Honor God, love your parents with all your heart. No. The fourth commandment, though, is the only one people still battle over. They fight tooth and nail to justify that the Sabbath is no longer the Sabbath or the Sabbath is not the seal of God. It's the only commandment where he says, I am the Lord your God, title. Uh, all heaven and earth and all that's within them, territory. And I created them, that's his authority. Just like a presidential seal or a king's ring or signet, it's very much like that. But yet, it's the only commandment where they go, no, 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 that one's been done away with. Or how about murder? No, that's still in play. Or how about adultery? Still in play. Covet? Don't do it. But the Sabbath, that's, I mean, come on, who's going to know? Who's going to know? Nobody will know. But this whole week we've been learning, this whole month we've been learning how important the Sabbath day is. It's a token. It's literally a token, a sign between God and us that we will choose him in what seems insignificant and easiest to throw away, but is the most important thing to him. Amen? Again, in Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, we just read it. The Sabbath will be a sign between me and the Israelites for ever. And I'm not sure about you, I want to be rest and blessed and refreshed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21-22, it says, 
Now he who establishes us with you is Christ. Who is he? Who established Christ with us? Who gave us Christ? The Father did. Okay, so I'm going to replace that with God the Father, if you don't, just don't mind. So God the Father established us with you in Christ, and he anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and has given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. He's done four things. Anointed, given us Christ, the Holy Spirit, and sealed us in that one verse. That's a lot of promises, amen? And John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11 is going to be where the Holy Spirit convicts of the sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment to come. But all of this still comes back to Revelation. I want to go through Revelation chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 one more time. Then I saw another angel in heaven, right? He was ascending from the east where the sun rises, having the seal of what kind of God? The living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to do harm to the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. Brothers and sisters, that's today. That's where we're at in this prophecy. That angel has come down and is currently sealing us. After he's done sealing, what happens next? The winds will be released. The earth will be greatly harmed, right? And all those things we read in Revelation with the plagues and all that will start taking place. But what did Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and 31 say again? That God would collect us from the four winds, his elect. Last verse, Revelation 14, verse 12. This is the elect. This is the description from the Bible who the elect are. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith in Jesus. Of. Thank you. Now, what was this faith concerning? Of Jesus. There's a lot of answers for this one, isn't there? Nobody wants to get it wrong. The faith of his promises. The faith that he swallowed up the grave. The faith that his blood is enough. The faith that he chose us over heaven. The faith that he loves you as much as he says he does. And that he has prepared a place for you. And if he goes to prepare a place, then what? He says, I will. I, not I might. I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. The reason why I made it say egg because it needs to be visual. We are this egg. All right? The Father has us upon his feet. What is keeping this egg warm while it's on his feet? What is it? I could love as much as I want, but in negative 65 or negative 59 degrees, there has to be some insulating heat. The blood in the feet of the person this is resting upon. The blood flow, God's blood, is the only thing that's going to keep us alive on this planet, right? A little, 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 little more here. How close do we need to be to God to have that insulation? Can we, be, can we be far away? Can the egg be over here? No, absolutely not. We're in this egg because we're that little baby penguin, right? What can the baby penguin see right now? 
Nothing. It can't see anything except for its shell. What can the father see? Everything. Now, here's where it hits home. Right before the penguin comes out of its shell, right? Its world that it knows about cracks and breaks and begins falling apart. Do you see that? And though we can only see the world around us, cracking at the seams, the foundation giving way, and though we think it's going to fall apart any minute, who has control of this egg? God has control. You are not outside of his reach. He is a persistent and relentlessly loving God. Amen? He will not let you perish if it is his will. And he's going to hold on to you. Now here's the best part. When the world finally breaks open and we get to see beyond the shell, we'll see our Father, right? We'll know he's our Father, right? But guess what else? We'll look like him. We'll look just like the Papa Penguin. That's why we are like a penguin egg in a frozen tundra in a hostile environment that we cannot survive in by ourselves. Only through his grace, mercy, and love and his caring after us daily, every moment, not taking his gaze off of you, are we able to survive. It's nothing you will do on your own power. Now there's plenty more to study. And there's plenty more to talk about. But I'm going to make a quick appeal. Because Revelation 14, 12 doesn't say those who keep the Sabbath. It's important. And it's a token. Those who keep the commandments. Right? All ten. Not just one or two, not nine. All ten. And that's not easy. And as our kids mess up, we forgive them. As, as we mess up, God forgives us. But I want to make a renewed effort that we actually try to pay attention to our Sabbath a little closer. Last week when Pastor Harley was talking about the Sabbath, some people watch their clocks as that, as that sun starts going down, or they, they ask, Siri says, what time is the sunset? Okay, 825. Good. At 825, they're waiting for a pending, hoping that they don't miss any kind of blessing that's going to be outside of that Sabbath day. But may we instead enjoy our time with God. May we find it a delight and not a burden. Amen? All right, so my appeal is that simple. Let's be rested and blessed this day. And let's come out of it refreshed. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you made the Sabbath day for us that we can find you in it. You made the Sabbath day because you, you knew, Lord, that six days was enough to drive anybody crazy and that we would one day to break away from the world and to breathe for a moment. But Lord, may we not believe that we can take that seventh day and just use it how we please. But Lord, can we find joy in it with you? Can we find something to do in your name? That's something you would have us do that's not like anything we would do normally. In fact, Lord, allow it to be a skill that we don't possess. That way when we do it, we know it's you. But Lord, more so, re-encourage our energy. Help our health. And Lord, may we come out of the Sabbath more refreshed, more blessed, and set aside like you would have us. May we feel greater. May we feel a tangible difference. And may we, may we wish to return to the Sabbath that following week, looking for those blessings you store up inside that one beautiful day. 
And may we invite you to all our activities, even the ones that don't glorify you. May we invite you for that whole day. And Lord, through that, may you rejoice with us. May you dwell with us that day. May you be with us that day. But Lord, may we be with you and not anywhere else. We know the end's coming. We don't know if it's today, tomorrow, next week, next month. Lord, we don't know if we'll be around next week, next month, but you do. So, Lord, as the world starts falling apart, may we not be fearful. May we not be scared. But instead, may we be encouraged knowing that as these birth pains get closer and closer and closer, you, Lord, are closer and closer and closer. We look forward as soon and very soon day, Lord, that we're reunited with you to where we look beyond the shell of this world and we see your beautiful face. So until that day, Lord, keep us, protect us, lay a hedge around us and destroy the enemy who is trying to destroy us. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May his children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you and happy Sabbath.